Alliance family, we're on mission together. I'm so encouraged by the way that you've engaged, even just in recent days. You may remember that at the beginning of the COVID crisis, I came to you concerned because it felt like we were gonna have to pull back. And we did with budgets and with salaries, but we haven't had to pull back with personnel. We are caring in chaos because of you. I want you to know of some of the impact around the world that you're making because your workers have been allowed to stay in place. Our Comet team has been able to distribute $150,000 of meals and personal protective equipment and utility assistance through 72 of our churches in 23 states and Puerto Rico. Through your engagement with Envision, 300 families have been fed over a long period of time in Miami and 2,000 urban poor in Manila are receiving help multiple times a week. In one North African country, over 250 families have been able to be fed and seven new believers have been baptized. In South Asia, nearly 100 human trafficking survivors have received emergency food rations through your access teams. In West Africa, for example, hundreds of street kids are being fed through the local church in the secular nation of Uruguay, where COVID has caused people to reevaluate what life after death might mean. Two have found salvation in Jesus. So I started by saying Alliance Family were on mission together. I'm serious about that. And I want you to know what an honor it is to be president of an organization like this. When the human need increases, so does the responsiveness to the gospel. So the fact that we've been able to stay present, on location, being Jesus in these communities is very significant. Our calling is clear, our task is unfinished, but together we will stay on mission. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Faith Alliance Church. We are so happy that you are joining us this morning. I just have a few announcements for you. Um, as many of you know, we are online only today. Um, we're going to be together um, hearing from God's Word and worshiping um, from a pre-recorded service. And so sit back, relax, and enjoy. We hope that you hear from God Himself um, that he would fill you up and that you would be motivated and equipped to live in this world reaching people for Christ. And before we move on to that, I just have a few announcements for you. Um, we are canceling all in-person events like today um, up until the 29th. We will come back together on the 29th. That is a Sunday, so we'll have in-person Sunday services um, as well as our life groups and things like that. But all previous uh, scheduled events, Wednesday, uh, Youth Center on Friday, that's all canceled prior to November 29th. And then everything on November 29th and after will be resumed as previously scheduled. Myself, as well as uh, multiple other staff and volunteers, either had COVID or were uh, exposed to somebody with COVID and have been in or are still currently in quarantine. And so we thank you for your patience. Um, I also want to give you an update on our giving. As we've shared with you uh, about a month ago, is our giving is down this year uh, by a considerable amount, um, almost, almost $70,000. But in response to that, we have cut our spending by $48,000. And through your faithful giving, we are still in the black by $31,000. And so that is something definitely to say thank you, to, to praise God for, as he has uh, provided for us and carried us through this time. But I also want to ask that if you aren't giving or haven't thought about giving, that you would consider doing that today. Uh, it is fairly simple. Um, aside from bringing it physically here to the church, you can go to our website, faithalliancesydney.org, and just click the little Give button. When you click on the Give button, it'll just walk you right through the steps. Um, and uh, your financial support really does carry out God's plans here in this church. And $48,000 um, that we've had to cut back is, is funding that hasn't been able to be used to spread the gospel. And that's, that's what we want to do here. And so thank you again to those that have given. Um, 
please consider giving and please continue faithfully giving as we seek together as a church body, as one family, to reach this community for Christ. And on the giving front, I do have some exciting news. Next Sunday, you're going to be hearing about an amazing opportunity to give to missions going on around the world. The, the Alliance is putting forth another match giving. And so you'll be hearing about more information um, about that next Sunday. Um, again, we'll be in person next Sunday, the 29th. Um, another giving opportunity for you is the youth have their tie blanket fundraiser going right now. Um, we have sold uh, 12 out of the 60 blankets so far. All the youth spend a bunch of time putting all the blankets together, their tie blankets, and we sell them to you after we've made them all for you. And so the large blankets are $35 and the smaller blankets are $30. And please consider uh, purchasing those. They're great gifts. And all the money goes to the youth and their trips and missions trips. And mainly what your money is going to is providing opportunities for these youth to experience God in unique and awesome ways that they may capture and really see their creator in unique ways that they may live for him and share his love and his hope with the world around them. And so, again, thank you so much for all of you that have given faithfully. Uh, thank you so much for not just financially giving, but for praying and serving, um, participating, and being a part of the body. Uh, today you're going to hear from Paul about our position before Christ. And uh, I, I know, I know uh, God has something special for all of us today. So... Thank you for being here. Excited to hear what God does in your life. Uh, be active in the comments. Please share this live stream if you haven't yet already. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next Sunday in person. Thanks. Would you please stand with us as we worship together? <laughs>
horse is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. So, so good With every breath that I am in I will see Of the goodness of God I will see Of the goodness of God
come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. Right, so this week, our prayer focus and uh, who we want to be lifting up for blessing in our community is uh, Sunrise Women's Clinic. And, uh, so I'd encourage you to be lifting them up in, them up in prayer every single day uh, this week. They're on the front lines of uh, helping to address uh, a major need in our community, and that is uh, you know, ladies that are in a crisis pregnancy, and even those that aren't in a crisis pregnancy but just need help. Uh, they're a great resource for our community and one that is uh, founded in Scripture. So we want to make sure and, and be lifting them up. Well, let's go ahead and go for, to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that we have Sunrise Women's Clinic here in Sydney. And Lord, we ask that you would be blessing their leadership with clear guidance. Lord, we pray that you would give them boldness to love in a way that uh, reflects your love for those that uh, can come through those doors over there. And Lord, we ask for unity among the staff and the volunteers that are there. Lord, we pray for an abundance of resources. Whatever they need, Lord, we ask that you would provide it, and that you would uh, accomplish much in their midst. Lord, we pray that you would bless Pastor Paul today as he's bringing your word to us. Help our ears to hear clearly what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. Lord, help us to love one another today in a perfect love that reflects you. In his name, amen.
Stand with us for the last song before we hear from God's word. And if you bow your heads with me. Your glory is so beautiful. Lord, if we've lost sight of your goodness this morning, 
lost sight of your love, your care, your provision. Pray that we see that truth. We see the truth that we are your children and we lay our lives down for you. We declare you, our Lord and Savior, that you adopt us into your family. And all we simply have to do is run to you. Run to you with our joys, the highs. run to you with our lows. Because God, you are a father that wants to give us encouragement. You want to give us life. A life that's abundant in joy and love, but not dependent on this world. Not dependent on our circumstances, not dependent on the people around us, but dependent on you. Constantly want to bring us back to being dependent on you. Lord, you've already carried our burdens. You've invited us. I pray right now that we take this opportunity to lay those burdens down to run back to you. Fears, the worries, the stress, the anger, frustration, impatience, pride and false humility, we come back to your cross and declare you once again Lord and Savior of our lives. And we let it go. Pray all these things in your awesome and holy name. Amen. I've carried a bird. Too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now. I'm laying it down, and I know.
pray that we would continually run back to you again and again, knowing that we are your children, we are your beloved. We are made holy and blameless in your sight because of you, your son dying on the cross. There is nothing, nothing that can separate us from you if we lay it down at your feet and we ask for that forgiveness, repent of those sins, and run back to your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, may we always run back to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. morning. How would you like it if I start off by telling us we have a problem? We have a problem. Talked about it last week. Our problem is that apart from being reconciled with Christ, as we read in Colossians 1, 21 to 23, we are in a position of being his enemies. We are alienated from him. In fact, we are alienated from him. We are his enemies because of our problem. Our problem is we sin. We sin against a holy God. Thankfully, God, through his son Jesus Christ, has solved this problem for us. And by the way, it's very serious. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because apart from being reconciled with God, with Jesus Christ, we deserve to die physically. We deserve to die spiritually. We deserve to be forever uh, separated from him in a real place called hell, right? That's our problem. It's serious. Again, thankfully, God has solved that for us. And what we're going to look at this morning, uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Colossians 1, uh, 21 to 23. We read this last week. We looked at the first part of our problem. This morning, we're going to look at our position or our relationship once we are reconciled with God, how does he see us now? How does being reconciled with God, how does that affect our position, right? Last week we're seeing we have a problem, it's very serious. This week we're going to see that once we're reconciled with Christ, some amazing things happen. And I 
feel like I'm only spitting in the wind in trying to cover this this morning. Ben made mention of it. I'm going to make mention of it. You have this insert. Please take this home. Read these scripture. Get this into your head. Get this into your heart. This is the truth of how God sees us and the uh, transformation that's taken place in us and in our relationship with Christ once we are reconciled with him. So, Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. Once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So this morning we're going to take a look at verse 22. Anytime you read in Scripture, or anywhere for that matter, but especially in Scripture, when you see that little word at the beginning of a sentence, but, right, notice that there's a transition taking place. Remember before this, we're enemies, we're um, strangers, or I'm sorry, we're enemies in our minds because of God, we're alienated from him. But now, look at verse 22, but now, here's the transition, here's what's going to take place, the transition, but now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, through the death of Christ, to present you, look how different this is than verse 21, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. And I know some of you have already looked at verse 23, and it says, if, if you continue in your faith, establish firm. Okay, you got to come back next week. That'll be the conclusion to the series. I'm going to talk more about what that means, what Paul and what the Scripture teach on being established and firm in our faith, right? So next week, we'll look at our practice. But this morning, I want us to look at what does it mean to be reconciled with God, and how does that affect our position, our relationship with him? So first of all, it's helpful to understand what the word reconciled means, okay? When we use that term, when the Bible uses it, it's saying that we are being brought back to a former, um, we're being brought back to a former state of harmony, right? We're bring, being brought back to a right relationship. Now again, this can go all the way back to Genesis, where God created everything. We have Adam and Eve in the garden. They were living in a perfect environment, perfect relationship with God the Father. When they sinned, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, it destroyed, it ruined virtually everything. We're suffering as a result of that today. Our earth is suffering as a result of that. God wants to bring you, he wants to bring us back into harmony with him. He wants to bring us back into a right relationship with him. Again, like we noted last week, we have a serious problem. We sin. We sin against God. That makes us his enemy. We are deserving of death. We are deserving of eternal punishment. But now, but now, we can be reconciled back to God. We can be brought back into that harmonious relationship with him that he created and that he designed us to be in. And this is made possible through the death of Jesus Christ. So when we, we are reconciled with God, he took the initiative. He sends his son, his only son, his sinless son, to die in our place. When we, by faith, receive, respond in faith to him, he reconciles us. He brings us back into a right relationship with him. You need to understand from the beginning that being reconciled with God, being brought back into a right relationship with him is a work of God, right? Come to church. You can come to church every day of the week if you want. You can read your Bible from cover to cover. 
You can give all your money away. You can help anybody you want. That is not how we are reconciled with God. That's not how we are brought back into a right relationship with him. God reconciles us to himself through, by means of, the death of his son. How many of you are familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9. 2? This is amazing. I'm going to read it for you then. Because this is important to understand. Reconciliation is God's work. It is God's doing. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Reconciliation, then, being brought back into that former state of harmony with Christ, is a work of God, it is a gift that is given to us. If I had a gift up here, let's just take this for example, very beautiful, right? If I was to say this is a gift and it's for you, what would, have, what would the transaction have to be in order for this to be yours? I'm saying I'm, it's mine, it's not, it's mine. I'm gonna give it to you, I'm really not giving it to you, but work with me. What would, what would have to happen for this to be yours? I'm giving it to you. Somebody, you have to come and you have to take it, you have to receive it, right? That's the way it is with reconciliation. God is giving it to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Like, here, I got this. I've done this for you. How do we receive reconciliation then? How do we receive being brought back into harmony with God. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, by faith, we trust. By faith, we believe that God has done the work through his son, Jesus Christ, making it possible for us to be reconciled, to be brought back into a right relationship with him. It is not based on our works. It's not based on doing more good and less evil. None of that. We do not earn, we do not work for, we do not deserve being reconciled, being saved. You get it? Reconciliation is God's doing. He's giving it to us. It's a gift. Like any other gift, we have to take some action on our part to receive it, to make it ours. That action that God is calling us to is placing our faith, our trust, our confidence in him and in what he has done is sufficient to bring us back into that right relationship with him, to reconcile us. Are you with me? Reconciliation is God's work. What I want to look at briefly this morning is once we have come to Christ, once we have come to him by faith, we've surrendered everything we have, everything we are to him, right? When we are reconciled, now how does God see us? What changes in our relationship, in our position before God? Remember, before this, before being reconciled, we were his enemies. We were alienated from him. Evil behavior, it separated us from God. But now, but now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Okay, here's a little pop quiz, and I do need your response on this. How many of you see yourselves as being holy? Just raise your hand. That's what I figured. How does God see you when you're reconciled to him? We just read it a minute ago. Ephesians 1.4 tells us, that we are holy in his sight. God's eyes, God sees you when you are in Christ, when Christ is in you, he sees you as holy. Holy meaning sanctified, set apart for a holy purpose. God sees you as holy in what we read in Colossians and blameless. How many of us see ourselves as being blameless? And I know it's hard to see ourselves as holy. It's hard to see ourselves as blameless when we know what we say. 
We know what we do or what we don't do. We know what we think and we know what, you know what I'm saying? It's all this. And I'm trying, uh, scripture is really clear saying, look, here's the beauty of reconciliation. This is not something we do. This is something that God does for us and this is something that God does in us. He reconciles us. He gets us back into that right relationship with him. And he does this through the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And when we place our faith in Jesus, guess where Jesus comes to live? Right? Inside of us. Galatians 2.20, if you're doubting me, check it out. Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And we're going to get at this, who knows when, in Colossians that Christ lives in us. This is our hope of glory, Christ living in us. So let me ask you this question. I'll come at it at a different angle. Do you think when God looks at his son, Jesus Christ, that he sees Jesus Christ as being holy? Nobody batting an eye on that one. Yes, right? When God sees Jesus, he sees his son as being holy. Now here again is the beauty of reconciliation, We are brought back to that former state of harmony. We're brought back to right relationship with God. Jesus Christ now comes to live in us. So guess who God sees when he looks at you when you place your faith in Jesus? He sees his son, who is what? Holy and blameless. Right? Do you get it? It's not about us. It's not about what we do or don't do. It's about what Christ has done. It's about who Christ is. And this is amazing grace. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, this transition takes place, but now we are reconciled, but now we are brought back into. This is the relationship. This is the um, position that God has us in. Again, if we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, we see it. Adam and Eve are in perfect harmony, perfect relationship. That's what God wants for us, and that's what God does for us through reconciliation, through making us bring us back in the right relationship with him. Once you are alienated from God, once you are enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. I don't know about you, but doesn't this sound like almost too good to be true? God sees me as holy and blameless without any accusation? Are you kidding me? If we could only see ourselves the way God sees us, I am convinced our lives would be dramatically transformed. Like, dramatically. Why? Because what God does is dramatic. He does the work. We receive it. We walk in it. We live in it. Again, come back next week. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about how we live out what God has done in us. How do we how do we practice this being holy and blameless? How do we be established and firm in the faith? What are those practical things that you and I can do to ensure that we walk in, we stay in this position that Christ has put us in once we are reconciled with Him? Okay, so our position in Christ, we are holy in his sight. It also says that we are without blemish and free from accusation, Colossians 1.22. What I want to read to you are a couple more verses that talk about this without blemish, right? Free from accusation. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, what I'm going to share with you, there's one word to describe this without blemish. One word. In the English, we have it translated three different ways, three different, if you will, three different angles of this being without blemish. So what we have right here is Colossians 1.22. In his sight, he sees you without blemish and free from accusation. Ephesians 1.4, he says that he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So, without blemish, blameless. And then Jude 24, 25, 
we read that now to him who is able to keep us from falling and present us before his glorious presence, here's the third word, without fault and with great joy. One word, blameless, without blemish, without fault. That is how God sees you in Christ. Are you with me? This is significant. How in the world can God look at me? How in the world can God look at you and say you're blameless? You are without fault. You are without blemish. Again, he looks at his son, Jesus Christ, who, by that transaction of faith, comes to live within us. If I would ask again, is Jesus Christ blameless? You would say, yes. Is he without fault? Yes. Is he without blemish? Yes. That's who God is. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Do you want to believe what you believe about yourself? Do you want to see yourself the way you see yourself? Or do you want to start seeing yourself the way God sees you? Do you want to start living out the way God already sees you as a child of his? Okay, this is a real question, by the way. Do you want to continue to see yourself the way you see yourself? Or do you want to start seeing yourself the way God sees you? Boy, do a hard check, people. Start seeing yourself the way God sees you. And again, I make reference to this insert tons of ways that God sees us, how God treats us as his children. This is the truth. This is the truth. He sees you without blemish, free from accusation. I, everything, everything changes when we are reconciled with Christ. I'm going to take like five minutes here to give you a handful of other ways of how God sees us, right? Some of these are in that handout, some are not. I'm just telling you, amazing things happen when we are reconciled with God. Number one, and he... Paul also mentioned it in Colossians. We are free from accusation, right? Another way to say it is we are no longer condemned. Romans 8, 1 and 2, and now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. What does Satan want and what does he do to you every day? I'm telling you what, it's the opposite of this. He is accusing you day after day after night. He is worthless. She is worthless. She's not blah, 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 blah. Who do we tend to listen to? The enemy. Man, listen, this is God speaking. There's no condemnation for you because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit set me free, set me free from the law of sin and death. That's why we are no longer condemned. In Christ God sees you as a co-heir with Christ. A co-heir. What is an heir? Not an heir, E-R-R-O-R. H-E-I-R. We are an heir. We co-heir. We, we reign with Christ. Everything that Christ has come to him has come to us. Why? Because Christ is in us. We are in him. We will reign, reign, rule with Christ. We get this in... Um, uh, where am I at? Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You don't think your position has changed when you're reconciled? We are enemies of God, and now we're heirs. We're co-heirs with Christ. That's like we were on death row, and now we're, we're free. God sees you. Your position in Christ is that you are justified, Justified, a uh, uh, term to help you understand what does it mean to be justified by God. It means just as if you had never sinned. How can that be? God, when we are reconciled with God through Christ, we are justified. We get this in Romans 3, 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Please understand that through reconciliation, through being brought back into right relationship with God, you are justified, just as if you had never sinned. Not by your behavior, 
not by anything you've done or not done. It's by what Christ has done on the cross. Did Jesus Christ ever sin? Not once. He gives that to us. His righteousness, his justification given to us. A couple more. In Christ, our position, our relationship is that we are forgiven. And we are forgiven all of our sin. Listen to this, Psalm 103, one of my favorites. For as high, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Is that not amazing? As far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 85, 2 says, You forgive the iniquity of your people and covered, listen to this, covered all their sins. I think sometimes we think like, yeah, maybe most, you know, really, but not the really big bad ones. He can't possibly forgive. Yes, he can and he does. It's all cleansed. It's all washed by the blood of Jesus. When you are reconciled with God, you are forgiven. Receive that today. Receive that forgiveness of all your sins. And last but not least, you have eternal life. You have eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Never die? Of course we're all going to die physically. We know that. Jesus is talking about eternal life. We're not... Jesus said, This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you hear nothing else of what I've said this morning, hear this. Eternal life is more than getting something it is being in relationship with someone. Jesus said, eternal life is knowing God, knowing Jesus. It's a relationship. Back to the word reconciliation, we are restored in a relationship. The relationship is eternal life. And by the way, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're experiencing eternal life right now. You have Christ in you. Christ is eternal life. Yes, we're going to live forever in heaven. Yeah, that's, that's way off. Hopefully, maybe not. See how the world goes. <laughs> Eternal life is being in relationship with someone more than getting something, okay? And when we are reconciled, we are brought back into this relationship, which again, go back to Genesis, that's what God created Adam and Eve to be, living forever. Whew. Circle around. Through Christ, that's restored. Hmm? Is this not amazing? We are reconciled, but now we are reconciled through Christ. And I'm telling you what, I'm not even beginning to tell you of all that there is to this reconciliation and how God sees us. I don't know if I made mention of it yet this morning, but there's an insert. You're going to want to take a read through these verses. Get them into your head. Get them into your heart. Believe them. This is the truth. I've only touched on it this morning. I pray that we live up to what we have already attained in Christ Jesus. This is true, folks, whether we're going to believe it or not, whether we practice it or not, it is true. My prayer for myself, for us, is that we get it, that we live this, that we believe this, that we put it into practice and start seeing ourselves the way God sees us once we have been reconciled with him. Hmm? Totally different than when we're outside of Christ. Pastor Harry is going to come up here and close us. And this is going to be the benediction, and it is a responsive song. And this is an opportunity for you, through song, to declare some of this truth that I've just been talking about. Okay? This is a way to affirm the truth of Scripture. This is an opportunity to affirm 
if you are reconciled and if you're not yet reconciled, if you're not yet in that life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ, may, be, may this be the time where you surrender, where you confess your sins, receive forgiveness, where you place your trust, your faith in Jesus and be reconciled. And this is all true of you. Let us declare that through song. Um, yeah, I'm going to pray and then Harry, you can sing it. So, uh, Father God, what a gift this reconciliation is. I feel like I haven't even touched it. God, I pray that we'd really get it, not just get it as an in information, wow, that's good knowledge, but that we'd get it, it would transform our lives. And we have been brought back into a right relationship with you, not anything by what we've done, it's all by what you have done on the cross. That you see us as holy and blameless, without blemish, without fault. It does sound too good to be true. But it's not. It's your word. So God, give us the faith to lean into you, to trust you. And God, I pray that we'll experience a new life even this day and for the rest of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you stand with us one more time this morning. Christina, if you put that first slide up. Yes, thank you. You're on it. I'm going to sing the top line, and then I would ask you all to respond with the words that are in the parentheses. And then when we come to the chorus, we'll sing together. All right, let's sing together.
Amen. He is worthy. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week and great seeing you all.